We've got two Democrats, both lined up, both are running for president. Uh, but then, of course, Commissioner Martin O'Malley is now the commissioner of the SSA. And his job as commissioner is to fix the SSA while also beating the drum of those things that President Biden wants to be heard. So what I'm going to be going through are essentially those things that President Biden is going to be hitting hard and selling going into the future presidential election for 2024 to 2025, right? Because 2025 is officially when the presidential uh, changeover would happen where you either get the second term or not a second term. Let's go through them. This is essentially March 11, 2024 release date, immediate release statement by Commissioner O'Malley. On the president's fiscal year 2025 budget, uh, it was released by Mark Hinkle Press Office. Here we go. Key investments focused on improving the customer experience. So number one, you call in, you get somebody. They don't just hang up on you and you call in, you get somebody sooner. Uh, reducing wait times at all stages of the disability process. And not take, you know, it used to take three to six months to get a disability adjudication. Now it's taking 17 to 18 months. Okay. Uh, and then uh, reducing uh, stages of disability process in our national 800 number, which is a dismal thing right now, right? It takes forever to get somebody and then somebody hangs up. Modernizing our information technology. So they're trying to basically get all of their systems working better, uh, getting their systems to have artificial intelligence, like a recognized severity, non-severity, improving overpayment and underpayment processes. So essentially making sure that people get the right amount each month without having to go through this situation where they get underpaid, or overpaid, you know, and then three months later, the SSA catches up and figures it out and advancing equity by increasing access to our programs. Okay. The Biden-Harris administration today released the president's budget for fiscal year 2025. Remember, this is from, you know, the perspective of Commissioner Martin O'Malley. So he's, he's doing, you know, his, he, he's basically doing his political piece of this by pushing the agenda of President Biden. Okay, cool. So following the historic progress made, and, and just some people will wonder, some people will ask, should the, uh, you know, the office of the commissioner of the Social Security Administration, should that individual uh, be subject to or be required to or be prompted to give political statements on behalf of the president? Well, just to be fair, the commissioner is part of the direct cabinet of the president, right? The commissioner reports directly to the president. So, you know, they, they are, I mean, even though we would think that the agency would be like our thing, you know, we put money into it, we expect it to run properly for us. It's not. It's whoever is president's thing, right? Your retirement money is in the hands of whoever is president. Your social security disability insurance money, your supplemental security income money is in the hands of whoever is president right now, okay? Following historic progress made uh, since the president took office, with nearly 15 million jobs created and inflation down two thirds, the budget protects and builds on this progress by lowering costs for working families, protecting and strengthening Social Security and Medicare, investing in America and the American people and reducing the deficit by cracking down on fraud, cutting wasteful spending and making the wealthy and corporations pay their fair share. There was a lot there, but you know, keep in mind, I'll just go in reverse order, making the wealthy and corporations pay their fair share. That's where they're trying to get rid of the uh, you know, cap on essentially the 168,000 cap for FICA taxes. They want that to be removed for the most part, even if it takes a little bit with the donut hole, as they've explained previously. But the bottom line is this, they want to massively tax corporations and wealthy people a lot more. The kicker is, um, you know, the corporations are all, for the most part, struggling right now. So, you know, that's not going to happen. And then, of course, the president, uh, the, the super wealthy people, those are the people who pay for these political, you know, you know, giant, you know, careers when it comes to getting somebody in office, right? Because you need millions and millions and millions to get into office now. So are they willing, are they realistically, are the, are the Democrats re realistically going to crack down on the wealthy? No, absolutely not. They're the ones who pay for them to get into office. So that's, I think that's flubber blubber. That's just not something that's going to actually happen. It sounds good. Like when you read it, it sounds good. It sounds strong, right? Cutting wasteful spending. Ah, sounds like a Republican thing. And making the wealthy and corporations pay their fair share. Sounds like a Republican thing. Um, very, bah, right? But it's 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 not. It's coming from, uh, you know, President Biden via Commissioner Martin O'Malley. And it's it's flubber blubber. They're, they're not going to make, they're just not going to get the corporations to pay more. And they're not going to tax the wealthy more. It's just, it's not, it's against their own interest for getting back into office. Now, the uh, reducing the deficit by cracking down on fraud they are in a massive audit stage. A lot of the veterans are also going through this, their own OIG massive audit stage, where a lot of them are getting kicked off of their benefits, their higher level of benefits. So to be fair, what this comes down to is we are seeing 
basically a crackdown where a lot of disability or disabled individuals are getting kicked off the program is because they're no longer severe enough uh, or they just were never severe enough to begin with. Okay, next one. Uh, investing in America and the American people. Uh, so, you know, we, we have yet to really see the full extent of that, but we're going to go through it basically later where they're actually talking about creating an entirely new benefit system under the Social Security Administration that will pay you if you are put into disabling situations, not just being disabled, but disabling situations, which is very interesting. Uh, the next thing that they're talking about is uh, basically protecting and strengthening Social Security and Medicare. They're throwing money at the problem. Uh, and then basically lowering costs for working families when it comes to medical treatment, medication, stuff like that. The budget makes critical target investments in the American people that will promote greater prosperity for decades to come. At the Social Security Administration, the SSA, the budget will look like the following. Okay, so now we're going to boop, 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 go what their intentions are. Number one, protect the Social Security benefits that Americans have earned. The, and what's, what's interesting about that is that, like, you know, they said that they have earned. They didn't really in the sense of like, I don't think earned is the right, is the way, way to put it. I think a stronger word would have been that they paid for, right? Because the, when they put it on the, like, you've earned it, right? Good for you. Oh, blah, 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 blah. You know, they, they, that, that's not realistically, it's more of a, we paid for it, pay us our shit, right? That's, that's the relationship we have with the SSA. The administration is committed to protecting the strengthening and strengthening social security and opposes any attempt to cut social security benefits as well as proposals to privatize Social Security. Now, just to be fair, the you know the Republicans haven't talked about privatizing Social Security since like the Bush era, but the Democrats use that as the decades-long approach to attacking the Republicans. We will prevail over that. You know, it's one of those kind of gigs. So, the administration believes that protecting Social Security should start with asking the highest-income Americans to pay their fair share. share. And it, OK, and just to be fair, again, the Democrats are never going to get the wealthier people to pay their quote unquote fair share. And, and here's why. Uh, we already have a progressive system. The people who haven't paid in much get a ton of money in comparison to the people who have paid a lot who get very little money out of the system. And I know there's going to be comments like I paid in all this money and I'm not getting anything. Wow. If you compare you to the person who paid the maximum amount, you are getting many, many times what that person is getting. And then, of course, we get the comments back. Yeah, but they don't deserve it because they have money. I'm not getting into that. I'm not getting into the whole they worked hard or they inherited a family that, you know, was successful or lucky. Or I'm not getting into that. The point is it's super progressive. It's like a very, very progressive program. But the point is they're never going to get wealthy people to pay more because those wealthy people use that money to give it to, you know, the events and the politicians and the super PACs to get these politicians in office. So it's just never going to happen. It's never going to happen. OK, next one. Uh, so committee, blah, blah, blah. OK, the administration believes that protecting Social Security should start with the asking the highest income Americans to pay their fair share. Ain't never going to happen. In addition, the administration supports efforts to improve Social Security benefits as well as SSI benefits for seniors and people with disabilities, especially for those who face the greatest challenges making ends meet. What's interesting is that we did not see them mention asylum seekers. Uh, we did not see them mention basically uh, different types of immigrants, uh, refugees who are potentially eligible for the seven years of SSI benefits with the two year up. And that's because the president is always trying to downplay the fiasco at the border, what's happening essentially with the amount of immigrants that have come into this country, what's happening with those immigrants when they come to this country and they end up in the hands of criminals who then use them for trade and things like that. So the president is very heavily playing down that part of it because ultimately what the president is hoping for, and I mean, I, this is from my opinion, but I think it's pretty well proven for from a, from a very basic perspective that vote farming is real. Uh, if, we, if we look at, if we look at the, the traditional versions of vote farming, if we go all the way back, right, if we go all the way back, vote farming was always practiced on particular groups of people, right? They would categorize a group, they would categorize that group, and then they would essentially put them into a victimized category. And then that victimized category would vote Democrat to go ahead and sort of like get the benefit of whatever benefits of changes and rules they could get, right? Because America is all about advantages. It's all about advantages. So, you, you know, my people, Jewish people, African-American people, they were all in the victim classes, right? And so as a result of that, you know, they would, you know, as a preference and tendency towards having rules that would protect them more, vote Democrat. And so as a result of that, you know, that was it. Now, 
African Americans, Jewish people aren't voting as much Democrat as they used to. You know, whether you're a Democrat or Republican, it's you know, you just go look at the stats. And so as a result of that, they need a new class of individuals that will represent essentially a core victim class block, which of course will be the immigrant. Now, this is a brilliant plan on behalf of the Democrats. It's super smart to do that because if they can pull it off, which they have completely done at this point for the most part, then they've created a future massive generation of individuals who can vote to keep Democrats in office across the spectrum at the county level, at the state level, at the Fed level, et cetera. Okay, now uh, let's see what we've got here. Next one, improve service delivery. The administration is committed to improving service. <clears throat> delivery for more than 6 million retired survivor and Medicare claimants, as well as the more than 2 million individuals applying for disability and supplemental security income every year. So what they're talking about is like, you know, going through the process, not having it take 17 months, you know, going through the process and basically, you know, being able to uh, adjudicate claims faster. Right. Okay. Uh, the budget requests a 15.4 billion in discretionary budget authority, a 1.3 billion or 9% increase over the 2023 enacted level to improve customer service at SSA's field offices, state disability determination services. That's DDS. Those are the ones that adjudicate your claim at the initial filing and reconsideration levels and teleservice centers for retirees, individuals with disabilities and their families as well. The budget also improves access to SSA services by reducing wait time. So the main thing is President Biden saying we need to throw more money at the problem, and he is 100% correct. The SSA does not have enough funding. The Republicans are completely wrong when it comes to, well, we're giving you this budget and we're giving you that budget. No, the SSA doesn't have enough money to properly actually do this whole thing. And to be fair, they're not paying their employees enough because the employees morale is super shit right now. And unfortunately they're quitting on mass. And so you got, you know, an SSA with like 60 to 65,000 employees, <clears throat> they need about 90 to 95,000 employees to make it work properly. So they're about a third down from what they need. And they're going to need to find ways to entice more people to work for the SSA. Okay. Okay. Next thing here. Um, all right. So the budget ensures we will deliver accessible social security services to all eligible individuals while maintaining, maintaining rigorous stewardship and oversight over our programs. Okay. Our programs must reach underserved communities and people facing barriers to accessing our services, including individuals with, here we go, low income, limited English proficiency. And so these kind of fall into like, you know, your, your, uh, classifications of native groups of like Native Americans, uh, Native Samoans, uh, Native you know Hawaiians, etc. <clears throat> Limited English proficiency, mental and intellectual disabilities, and those facing homelessness. In my opinion, somebody who works with the system every single day and works on it every single day. April, thank you, thank you for the five dollar nation. Doggy Bones, hope Sweetie's doing better. She's doing well. Uh, I was in the pool with her yesterday, holding her up while she was kicking. So we were doing some of that like you know physical therapy stuff, some PT. She's somewhere around here because I was hearing her eating a uh, thingy, like one of those little chew thingies. So she's in here. She's in, in here somewhere. But um, yeah, so basically, just for you guys don't know, Sweetie went through surgery uh, where they had to go ahead and cut into her leg, cut the bone in half, and then rotate her whole leg five degrees. Major, 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 which is why I always look tired because... I work constantly and I also have to pick her up and move her and stuff like that, but she's getting much better. But we actually have been sleeping on the couch because I can't let her sleep on the bed because she can't jump up there. And I'm always worried about her jumping down. All right. Next thing. Um, <clears throat> so our program must reach these groups. If you want my honest opinion out of the following groups, the one they need to work on the most uh, when it comes to barriers, accessing services, uh, they talk about low income, limited English proficiency, mental and intellectual disabilities, and those facing homelessness. <clears throat> those facing homelessness and those who are homeless, which is what I think is interesting. They didn't actually put homelessness. They just put facing homelessness. Um, they should have put homelessness there. But the homelessness problem, Florida, Texas, California is rampant, is rampant. And so it's only getting worse. There's not enough housing. The government isn't building enough housing uh, units. Um it's just getting worse. That's the one where they need to focus it because, you know, basically that's the bottom of the net where, you know, if you can't catch them there, they just end up in the woods. That's where they need to focus the most effort. 
Uh, the budget also supports our efforts to simplify and update the SSI application process and expand access to agency programs and services throughout our outreach efforts, particularly for underserved communities. So what's happening is the SSA realizes that attorneys are no longer going to help out, for the most part, sub mile security income people because attorneys make far too little to do these disability claims to begin with. And so when you underpay the disability attorneys, you've taken out the most qualified, the most intelligent and, you know, knows the law and can fight on their you know, behalf and zealously represent them. You take all of that and you throw it down the drain. And what you're left with is saying, okay, well now internally we have to find people and have them do what the attorneys were trying to do. And then, you know, basically have them try to get people filed and they, they're not allowed to legally advise them. So I, all they can do is basically get them filed. That's, that's the main thing is finding the people and getting them filed. But that's what happened. If you guys were ever wondering, remember when I, when I said that 10 years ago, I said to you guys on YouTube or one of the video programs, I said, Hey, look, they're paying these disability attorneys far too little for the amount of work that they're supposed to do on this claim. So these disability attorneys just kept doing less and less and less and less. But ultimately what happened was I said, look, you know, there's going to be a time where disability attorneys will not represent SSI people at all. And we are now years past that point. But remember how a lot of people called me, you know, somebody who was fear mongering. Oh, they'll always represent ah, blah, 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 blah. Bullshit. They don't represent SSI people anymore because they can't make enough per claim. Okay. We will improve our IT system to provide a more consistent, equitable, and accessible experience for our customers, reduce burdens some manual processes for our employees, increase self-service options on our national 800 number, and expand our cybersecurity program. Further, the budget prioritizes preventing the resolving improper payments. Those are your overpayments. So basically, tech boost. That's what they're trying to do is automated movements automated completion tasks. Now, some of you guys haven't been working in 15, 20 years, but the way computer systems work now is that, you know, when they first started coming out with these CMS systems, you'd click on something, you'd have to do like every function, click, enter, click, enter, click, enter. Well, now the systems are coming out where they, you know, automatically fill in certain things based off of what it looks like you're doing. And then you can click and hit it, or you can have it automatically fill something in, or you can change it if it's not correct. They're looking to automate the little things to make it go faster and make it be quicker for their employees. Next one, provide national comprehensive. All right, now here's the, here's the big one. Here's the big promise from President Biden, the big push. But remember, all of this stuff has to be approved by the Senate and the House and all that jazz. So remember, at the end of the day, you know, well, we can go more into that. But the point is, at the end of the day, Congress has to approve this budget going forward. They've got to rubber stamp that puppy. So the point is, <clears throat> just to make it clear here, this is the big ask. The next one is the big ask that President Biden is making when it comes to Social Security benefits going forward. This is the biggie. And when I first read it, I was like, I don't, man, I don't know if we can, as a country, pay for this when we're already kind of in the hole of being able to pay for these other programs. Because remember, in order to pay for any of this stuff, you have to have a really successful, magical first world economy. And we don't have a magical, successful first world economy right now. You know, remember when everybody was like celebrating, look, we went from nobody working to everybody working. It's the best we've ever done. Well, you know, when you have COVID, you know, and like a lot of people didn't fall for that. The American people are getting smarter about it. They're getting much smarter about the BS tactics that politicians use. And so people are just like, yawn, give me a break. Like, you know, I don't need your fluff today. And so the reality is this, at the end of the day, this right here, when it comes to President Biden promising something, this is massive. Can we afford this? No, no, we can't. Do we have to fix the programs we're already using? Yeah, yeah, we do. So this can't happen until we fix what's already going on. So when you hear this and you categorize it in your brain as to what these promises are, these promises are situations where you will get money if the situation causes a disabling effect, like you can't be who you normally are, if the situation causes you to not realistically be able to work, if the situation causes you to become disabled in some way, manner, or form, that is essentially what this is all about. All right, here we go. Provide national comprehensive paid family and medical leave. And remember, President Biden was talking about this all the way, you know, three and a half or whatever years ago when he first had his original White House website up, oh, pre-White House website. The vast majority of America's workers do not have access to employer-provided paid family leave, including 73% of private sector workers. 
So just to be fair, most, you know, let's just clarify this. Most uh, businesses are struggling right now. Most of them. It's a really bad economy. I know some of you are like, it's the best economy I've ever lived in. And I know some of you just don't understand basic things. I get that too. I'm trying to be nice about it, but you got to understand, you know, people going to the grocery store, they're struggling. People going to the business grocery store, struggling even more, way more expensive. Cost of metals is insane right now, literally at a level that is just not capable of allowing Americans to buy things with metal in them. Anyway, the point is, um, here we go. The vast majority of Americans or workers do not have access to employer-provided paid family leave, including 73% of private sector workers. That's because the government set up a system where companies can't make enough, and as a result of that, they can't provide for extra benefits. So the government is now coming in and saying, well, these companies aren't doing it. We're going to do it. We're going to take care of you. Right? 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 Here we go again. So the government failed the American people and the capitalism system that they were making tons of hands, you know, just tons of money, right? Hand over fist money. They were doing great. So they ruined that. And now they're looking at this and saying, well, you know, I guess we'll have to create a program to help these people get through this. Now, people will counter argue and say, well, they've never had all of that and they've never done this. And I, I, from the deep down little wiggly part of my heart would say this. BS. BS. You come from the world where there were pensions. You come from the world where there were 401ks that people were able to use. Just to clarify, can you guess what's in my pension fund? Zero dollars for the future. I have no pension. Can you guess what's in my 401k? Zero dollars. I don't have a 401k. We don't make enough as millennials. We have student loans that suck our accounts every single month. So just to clarify, just to clarify how this all works, the government ruined capitalism and now capitalism can't afford to give a higher standard of living to future Americans. Those who come from the past when there were pensions and there were 401ks, and there were key off accounts and Christmas accounts and this account and blah, 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 blah. That's a different world. You lived in a world where the government had less control over capitalism. Now they've squeezed it dry. And now they're looking back and they're like, well, people are pissed and they don't want to do this shit anymore. So what we're going to do is we're going to create a national comprehensive paid family and medical leave. That is the reality. That's it. That's that's the reality. That's what happened. Okay. So. All right. Uh, so, OK. Now, among the lowest paid workers who are disproportionately women and workers of color, 94 percent lack access to paid family leave through their employers. In addition, as many as one in five retirees leave the workforce earlier than planned to care for an ill family member, which negatively impacts families, as well as the national labor supply and productivity. Now, one of the th statistics that they don't really include in this is that women are almost always the ones who have to take care of elderly like parents, right? The parents get elderly, women have to stop at the career and then they go to take care of them and help them, et cetera. So that is, a, you know, that's a major thing because the males are expected to go out and earn, right? You know, because if we're just honest with each other about the dynamic of work and how it works between males and females, right? Males are expected to be tough, not whine, get out there, earn money, bring home the bacon and make it work. But now we can't earn enough. We can't. We're doing the same jobs. Can't afford shit. Right. So now women have to work. And, you know, it does make it does pull into question feminism at this point when it comes to like, where is feminism at when all of the rules that make things equal and benefit women, you know, when those have all been passed? Because, you know, when you look at the rules, almost all the rules that are left that have anything to do with like how we treat women versus men are to the disadvantage of women if they get passed where they have equal standing with men. Like, for example, forced military service in case of a war situation. Have you guys realized that feminism hasn't tackled that one yet? Have you guys realized that feminism hasn't tiptoed into that particular squalor? That's because we, I guess, all people, men and female, don't feel the draft would be appropriate in the same sense for women. And here, let's look at it. Let's look up the current uh, female, let's, uh, female draft in America. Maybe they passed something. Let's see. 
Uh, as of uh, January 2016, there's been no decision to require females to register with selective services or be su subjected to a future military draft. Let me, let me explain why that is, okay? Let me just explain why. It's because feminism has worked to create an equal standing for women for the stuff they wanted, right? But not a total and complete equal standing across the board because they don't want certain stuff. No one wants to be drafted, but for a very small percentage. No one wants that. Go look up the difference between rules in the military with female hair versus male hair. Go look at the rule. Just go, go look them up. You will be amazed at how feminism has created a better society for women than I think the whole idea of a fair, equal, whatever that we ever expected. And of course, the other problem that we see with the, the statistics here is that some men earn massive amounts. Because it goes back to that time when men were considered, you know, head of the household and their generation after generation after generation, they would build this business and they would inherit and then they were expected to take care of the family. There's generational wealth stuff out there as well. And what's happened, what's interesting about this is that at this point, I, I just I just saw a blasty pow pow. I wouldn't mind if women could be called up for selective service. Many countries do that. Yeah, but let me ask you this. How old are you? Like, what is your age? Like, give me, you don't have to give me your exact age, but give me a roundabout age figure. Cause you know, if you're in your 40s or you're in your 50s or you're in your 60s, like you don't really have a, a right to vote on that one because you're never going to be in it. You know what I mean? Like, that's the thing. Like, if it doesn't affect you, should you really be able to vote on it? You know, like that's that's the so to, okay, oh, all right, th no, but th 35. That's still too old. You, you're too old to really be brought into it. So my question is, like, you know, when it comes to like who should be in the draft? I think young women, right? And young men should be the ones who get to vote on that because they're the ones who ultimately are going to be stuck in that situation. I am too old to vote in that. I'm too old for the vote. I'm, I'm 37. I'm going to be 38 soon. I'm going to be 38 next month. Okay. I'm too old to vote for that. I just, I, and I get that everybody will have to vote. I understand how the voting process works, but if you're in that age group, if you, okay. And you're still, I would still would have done it. Sure. I, but let me let me explain something about the military real quick, because I think a lot of people get uh, they're not certain. They're not certain about this. When you sign up for the military, you either go into a combat situation, you know, sort of training or you go into more of an administrative sort of training. Right. So combat ish or administrative. Those are your two forks. Right. You go off on those two options. Sure. There's ones that share. And uh, yeah, but it's you fork. Right. Marines. Navy SEALs on one side, and then you have ordering parts for the U.S. Air Force on the other side, okay? Not everybody is meant to be a warrior. Very simple, very straightforward. Not everybody is meant to be a warrior. The problem I have is that people do not realize when war comes to fruition, the administrative people get dragged into the combat section, and they don't have a full comprehension of what bullet wounds in bodies actually are. If you ever get a chance, my recommendation, and I might cause you PTSD, so of course use your own mental standing on where you, you know, think what you think you can handle, but go look up these gory pictures. Go examine them. Go see the videos where somebody is shot down. Go, go see them because it will change the reality that you live with internally because Americans are one of the most amazing groups of people who are completely sheltered from reality of war. We have no clue about how war is as Americans. We just don't. Our military personnel that are in combat, they do. They get it. But Americans are completely devoid of understanding of how war actually works. They don't understand what happens when a bullet hits the body. Frankly, they don't even understand how firearms work. They just don't, right? They're like, oh, that thing is, oh, that thing's a this thing. It's going to do this. And I'm sitting there as somebody who grew up on a farm and I get frustrated because I get, uh, I get like, I don't know how to explain to people who are that disconnected from reality. And that's one of the big things is that I, I truly believe that every American that is of, you know, sound mental capability should be trained with firearm. I truly believe that. I'm not saying all of them should have to go into the military, but they should be trained on basic firearm, holding, handling, safety, all that stuff. Because what will happen is you won't have confused people. Not, not just like, you know, their brain can't get to that point of understanding it. It's just confusion because they don't have any experience with it. 
So, and, and I just, I want to point that out. And that, that's another thing too. Like a lot of people didn't grow up on the farm. They haven't seen somebody whose hand got cut off because the mower blade, you know, they, they pushed it too hard. It automatically started the, the, you know, the, the engine, you know, you got the, the spark plug just went off and then poof, all of a sudden now they're missing a finger, they're missing a hand. When I grew up, everybody was missing something, right? Cause it was farm country shit happens. It, it was what it was. Right. And then you have other people, you know, they get kicked uh, by, you know, one of the, one of the bulls. Or one of the horses kicks him in the head. So part of their head, right? Their cranium is basically sunken in. You know, there's all this stuff that you grow up around that's just normal for you. But people in the city are like, it's how could this happen? <clears throat> and that's because if you look at cities and the population in cities, it's a different type of American than like everybody else. Like you look at these really tiny areas and they just have no experience with livestock. They have no experience with like, you know, horses, uh, you know, basically <laughs> unpaved roads. They have no experience with like where food comes, how food is grown. Food coming out of the ground is weird. Like their big thing is like buying a tomato plant and then like two years later having tomatoes and being like, wow, interesting. This is this is how it's birthed, right? <laughs> the stork bought me tomatoes. <laughs> Look at these. So it's just weird. It's weird for me. And I know I'm off task here and I get that. And, uh, you know, the point of this video was actually for me to say, I think Martin O'Malley is going to do a good job, but the point of this video was not to go this far off track with it. But the point is, and what I'm trying to tell you is, what I'm trying to tell you is, um, <laughs> Diane Fernandez says, Walter, just so you know, I'm only 20 years old. I don't know, Diane. I got I to gotta question that one. I think you're young, but not that young. I don't, I don't know. My point is, <clears throat> if you ever get a chance to talk to like a, a, a Vietnam vet, you know, or uh, somebody, you know, a Korean vet, uh, if you ever get a chance to talk to them and they're willing to share, that would be a good introduction to understanding the basics of war, if they're willing to share it, if they're willing to, because you'll have an amazing human to human connection. They'll be able to tell you the realities of what war are, and they'll be able to go ahead and convince you of, of what America is really about. Like, why do people actually fight for these values, these freedoms? These are things that city people will never have. They will never have them. They're not, they're, they're just, they genetically remove themselves from like the, the homegrown origin story of America. Um, James Moody, thank you, thank you, thank you for the $20 donation. That's absolutely amazing. Uh, happy St. Patrick's Day. I don't really drink. If I ever drink, I have like one beer, uh, basically a year with lots of blueberries in it. Up in Maine, it's a blueberry beer. I know most of you would be disgusted by that. I just can't drink beer because I get a stomach ache. My face turns red. I'm like the opposite of a drunk. I have like one beer and I look miserable. I'm just miserable. Uh, but I've had a lot of friends who, who who can drink magically delicious amounts. And I, I, I remember when I was in Berkeley College of Music, they would take like the big bottles, not like the, like the little one, like, not like the sky, this or like the little shape, not those, the ones that were like this, this tall and like had like the cool little shape, but not those. They would take the big bottles and they would chug the alcohol. And I was always amazed. And usually they were Irish and, you know, I was in Boston, you know, so obviously the high percentage of them. Uh, and such amazing partiers. Like if you ever want to go to a party that's like next level, you go to an Irish party. Those are those are people who professionally party. So anyways, um, let's keep going through this. My apologies for getting off track. Uh, the budget request, 15.4 billion. That's 9% increase. Very good. Um, they're talking about underserved. They're talking about IT tech. Now here's the next part, okay? In addition, as many as one in five retirees leave the workforce earlier, right, than planned to care for an ill family member, which negatively impacts families as well as the nation's labor supply and productivity. This is true, especially for women. Uh, so I'm surprised right here that they did not specifically mention women, because women are usually thought of as the caretakers, right? When we think about like, like even the Barbie movie, right? Remember the, remember that I was actually like, my brain like rang a little red, like, you know, blaring siren when, when they said, and we seriously had to disinfect the houses once you guys took over, right? When they were taking back the houses in the Barbie movie, I was sitting, it's just like, I clean a lot. Like, what the hell is this shit? And, and that's what it is. Women are seen as the caretakers, the keep things up, the clean things, to keep things safe, take care of the next generation coming up. That's how they're seen. Take care of the generation that's becoming retired and elderly, et cetera. So this does disproportionately affect women where they don't get the most benefit out of their social security benefits. Now, the program would provide workers with progressive partial wage replacement to take time off for family and medical reasons, include robust administrative funding and use an inclusive family definition. Remember, 
inclusive family definition can be we're going to do a video on the defining of a family because the Supreme Court has ruled on it that when you define a family, it just, it's not just genetics. It's not just bloodlines. A family can be something much bigger than just the genetics of somebody. The budget would provide 12 weeks of leave to allow eligible workers. Now, here, okay, so here's, here's, here's the really important stuff, okay? Number one, the budget would provide up to 12 weeks of leave to allow eligible workers to take time off to care for and bond with a new child. What do you guys think? Do you think 12 weeks is enough, right? Do you think somebody should be able to take off from work for 12 weeks? Do you, do you think that that's appropriate? I mean, we're basically getting something similar to what the politicians already have on their books, then we would be able to access something like that. Do you think that that's something that like, you know, would be that you would want? I mean, everybody wants 12 weeks off from work, especially when a child's born, you want to connect with the child and some new baby and stuff like that. I get that. But do you think that's an appropriate amount? I am not a good judge of that because I have two dogs and I have zero babies and I have zero girlfriend right now because I'm constantly working. So I would ask you guys what you guys think. That's all on you. Like, do you guys, what do you think? Yes, Walter, Mina, okay, great. there you go. There you go. <laughs> so uh, next one here, uh, care for seriously ill loved one. Okay. So you get 12 weeks to take uh, care of a seriously ill loved one. Heal from their own serious illness, okay? Address circumstances arising from a loved one's military deployment or find safety from domestic violence, sexual assault, or stalking, otherwise known as a safe leave. Do you guys agree that people should be able to get 12 weeks paid, basically medical leave, family leave, whatever, in those instances? I don't think it's a bad idea, but I think that you know, if we're talking like each year that they can potentially get 12 weeks off by just claiming this and then claiming this and then claiming this, that's going to put a very heavy burden on those, you know, on those, you know, employers to get everything done. So I'm not sure exactly how they're structuring it. I have to go look at the actual full budget, but that's the first thing in my brain that rang up. How the hell are the employers going to really pay for this? Are the employers going to have to pay a new social security tax on top of the tax they're already paying? Because in total, they're already getting over 15% between Medicare and uh, retirement and disability benefits and all the other social security programs. So fifth, over 15%. Of your check gets taken just to go towards the stuff. Are they going to boost it to 20? Are people going to be okay with more taxes being taken out? How is this going to be abused by people who know how to work the system? Okay, so let's keep rocking through this. The budget would also provide up to three days to grieve the death of a loved one. Um, budget would also provide up to three days to grieve the death of a loved one. That, I think, is an under. <laughs> so it's ironic. You get you get 12 weeks potentially for these other ones, but you get three days when a loved one dies, I don't think three days, I, if that, if so, I would flip it, I don't know if 12 weeks would be fair for the other one. I might bump it down to eight. I don't know. Maybe to, I don't know. I work all the time. I have no personal life. So <clears throat> to me, I have a skewed understanding. So I want to know what you guys think about that one. I'm going to read the comments a little bit later, but three days to grieve the death of a loved one. <sighs> and then how do you prove that they were like somebody that you were close to? How do you prove that they were like a loved one? Is it just like, okay, well, this person died and therefore, you know, they were a close genetic family member? Or is it like, you know, just this, we 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 claim family is a very open term. So you can just start claiming, okay, this person, that person, that person. I don't know. I, I see a lot of potential for abuse here. I, I really do. But I do like the idea. I just, I want to read more details about it. I'm going to go through the full budget too, so we can actually see what the language is in a more detailed level. The administration looks forward to continuing to work with Congress to make this critical investment strengthen America's economy. You know, the thing is this, the argument that people shouldn't get that much time off means that it weakens the ability of that job, of that place to continue to work and be productive, right? The people aren't there working, then they're not going to be as productive. The other side of the coin is Americans, my, you know, generation, well, the Gen Xers, the millennials, the Gen Zers, stuff like that. We are at a point where we all have anxiety and we all have depression because the economy has betrayed us. The government feels like it's betrayed us. So if we had more time off, we would probably we'd probably take that time to try and invest it into something that would actually make more money than just being stuck in the rot rail of rotating around and never having enough. Right. We'd probably use that to invest in figuring out a future for ourselves. God knows we're never going to get out of the student loan problem. So it is what it is. The budget builds on the president's record while achieving meaningful deficit reduction through measures that cut wasteful spending and ask the wealthy to pay their fair share. 
I think, uh, I think, all right, let me just read that one more time. Okay. The budget builds on the president's record. The record's not great. The record's not good. While achieving meaningful deficit reduction through measures that cut wasteful spending and ask the wealthy to pay their fair share. Uh, I just, I don't know if I agree with that last paragraph slash sentence. I just don't feel inherently that that's accurate. Do I feel that if he had four more years, he could deliver on that? <sighs> Let's just be honest. Martin O'Malley would be a better presidential option, right? He's doing the commissioner thing right now, but as comparison against Biden, clearly commissioner Martin O'Malley would be a better president. Martin O'Malley, you know, it, uh, president O'Malley. I would feel more comfortable with that than then the last three years have not gone so well. And the statistics have been abused and manipulated in a mighty, mighty way. Um, so do I agree with that? No, I don't agree with that. Is this going to look, <clears throat> can I just make a, a very simple statement that some of you will hate me for, and I get it. I understand that some of you are going to be really pissed off about me saying this. Okay. I understand that. But considering that, Trump is always attacked. Everybody's always going after him. Legal lawsuits at the wazoo, so on and so on and so on. President Biden has done many of the, literally, literally many of the same things President Trump has done. President Trump is getting sued. President Biden gets, you know, a, a get out of jail free card, right? And this keeps happening over and over and over and over and over and over again, okay? If we're really honest with ourselves, if President Biden did such a great job, then President Trump wouldn't be so popular right now. That's just the bottom line, right? Nobody would give a shit about Trump if Biden was rocking it. But Trump is doing really well right now. And I mean, you can see it in the statistics. He's winning all the polls right now as a result of things going so poorly in the economy and people not falling for the usual things. And I think this is, this is you know, as somebody who comes, you know, from basically uh, a minority-based uh, group, I got to tell you this, okay? Um, at the end of the day, what we have to realize is that there is a shift. Everybody's not making enough money. And when everybody doesn't make enough money to be able to survive, all these government programs are not enough, which forces people to find ways to be creative to make more money. Okay. You're going to see more people going on the ticket to work program. You're going to see more people taking their nine month trial work period and using it. You're going to see more of that across the board. This is all occurring because the federal government has not properly catered for, taken care of, assisted and lifted up American capitalism. That's it. That's it. If American capitalism was like, you know, on its thing, it would be doing a lot of the things that this is talking about. Now, do I think it's good that this conversation is going on, that we're talking about people having more breaks, taking care of themselves, having more productive people by uh, having more healthy people, having more rested people? Absolutely. friggin -lutely. Absolutely. This is a good thing. It's a good conversation to have. It's a good direction to go. But <clears throat> we got to make money as a country in order to be able to afford this stuff. And the economy is not doing well because we're following procedures that have put us in a very, very tricky situation. And I'm not going to bring up what's happening with our fuel reserves. And I'm not going to you know, catch up with you on what's happening with basically our ability as, uh, as a country to protect our borders or potentially protect uh, the federal government's interactions and licensing with these you know, corporations that do logging or you know, mining or this or that or whatever. I'm not going into that. But I will say this. I will say this. We can't afford this stuff well when we have all these wars going on. And I understand that we have to defend these places because they are the little rock in between the big bad and the big bad, right? Because, you know, Russia versus U.S. is never a good day for any of us. And that'll be the big thing. When you guys see somebody in the city going like, yeah, let's go take on Russia. They have no idea how war works. They just have a total disconnect with how war works. They have no understanding. They have no understanding. Like, it's just, you know, if you want to know where, like, the, the people come from, that end up in the military and then end up like, let me, let me, let me just simplify and certify the idea here for you. When people get out of the military, they're not dreaming about getting back to the city and living in a small apartment and dealing with a bunch of HOA bullshit. No, 
They're talking about going to South Dakota, North Dakota. They're talking about like getting into the boonies of, you know, basically, you know, any, it could be Nevada, Arkansas. It doesn't matter. The, the, you know, parts of Colorado, Wyoming, you know, going all the way up, right. All the way up. And the point here is they do this because they don't want to deal with the lies that the city dwellers live by. And that's the reality of it. And, you know, at the end of the day, I, it's, it's just one of those things where I, re I really wish we as a human population could have a better conversation with everybody. But we can't have a better conversation with everybody until people actually try stuff. You know, um, I am somebody who favors gun rights, right? I'm not somebody who favors a lot of hunting. Am I going to restrict somebody's rights to hunt? No, absolutely not. But, you know, th there, there is a situation where we are to some degree, you know, boxing out with all of our fences and our highways and our roads and our bridges. We are boxing out all of these natural animals that are wild, you know. And if we sit back and we say, OK, well, what are we doing to take care of them? How are we going to yeah. The, the problem it is, is that, you know, you get these city people who grow the city and then they get an animal in the city and they're like, how dare that animal be here? And, you know, and then they send in people to go and get rid of it or move it or whatever. It's just like, you know, when you sit back, it's just city people just don't know. And I, and I feel bad for it. And I wish I had a way to kind of get them to understand it. I mean, honestly, just a simple like video walkthrough of like, this is how life works. This is how things are grown. This is how things are processed. This is what they mean. And um, unfortunately, our politicians are a lot of city people. That's just the reality of it. Total disconnect with basic farm stuff. Ask yourself this, and this is my final comment on this, and then I'm going to pop over to the last video in about 10 minutes. But ask yourself this, okay? Um, ask yourself this. Okay, and I see a comment here from Tenebrous. I saved a video of Trump saying he'd be a dictator and his followers saying they want that. Um, I, I don't doubt it. I don't doubt it. You know, Trump has qualities very similar to, you know, Julius Caesar. I don't doubt it. But ask yourself this, okay, when I advocate on behalf of the farm people here, how many of you, how many of you have ever been inside a tractor, like an enclosed tractor, like a tractor that's, you know, going to go do work? How many of you? Any of you? Any of you at all? Anybody at all? Anybody? right? We've got one Michael. Okay. We got old school truck driver. That's fair though. Old school truck drivers definitely going to that. Slushy. Yes. Mega. Me. Mark. Unveil. I have. Okay. Euphoric. Yep. Okay. Uh, Tenebrous. I've never worked on a farm. Okay. Uh, freedom will ring. Always vote for freedom. Uh, Bill of Rights was given to us by our founders to protect us from big government. That's true. That was its main fundamental. Uh, Raymond Rodden. Hang up. Uh, hand up right there. Uh, right here. Uh, I have a combine that works. I had horses growing up. So the thing is this, these are, the, and this is the group that responded, right? But then there's other people in the chat who are like, I haven't, I haven't, right? I haven't. Yeah. Heavy equipment. That'll count too. I saw a video one time where people are talking about essentially those who are contractors and those who are not contractors. And, you know, you guys see me doing stuff on the house next door. So I kind of live in both worlds. My, my thing here with all this that I just want you to understand is that it's not, it's not to be a lesser person to do farming. A lot of people look down on farmers. It's actually a much better way of life at the end of the day. You, you feel far less anxiety and depression. You connect better with the outdoors. You feel all this freedom and relaxation and happiness. You know what you have to do. A equals B, B equals C, C equals D. One of the things I hate about owning a disability law firm and being in business all this time is that the federal government is a complete unknown when it comes to whether or not they're going to approve my claimants. Do you ever think about that from a perspective of a disability attorney? We prep the claim. We, you know, move it into this box formation so that essentially the SSA will be more likely to approve the claim, but we have no control over whether or not they're going to approve it. So we constantly live in this heightened fear of some group that is massively undermanaged, not enough tech, not enough money, you know, this, this, this agency that's underfunded is in the worst spot it's ever been in. We constantly interact with this thing that we don't have control over when it comes to the actual approval. Now, when you're farming, 
you can still not have control over, right? There could be a drought. There can be some sort of, you know, uh, you know, issue when it comes to a virus. It could be an issue that comes to a fungus. It could be an issue when it comes to a germ, right? You never have that control, but it's much more straightforward than what I do for a living, which is basically when you farm, A equals B equals C equals D, and then you have product and then you sell it. When you do disability law, you prep it, you prep it, you prep it, you hope, and then they get denied or approved. And then they spend months and months and you never know when your check's coming in. You never know. Whereas when you're a farmer, you know when the check's coming in because you know when the product is created and you know the process for when you're going to get paid usually. I mean, there's a lot of shitty people out in the farm world but who don't pay people, but that's, you know, A equals B equals C equals D. So the point is, um, I just want you to understand, consider, look at our veterans. Look at what our veterans do when they come out of the military. And I don't mean the people who serve for three years, five years, you know, six years, seven years. I mean the people who have served for, you know, multiple tours, you know, 10 years, 20 years, 30 years, whatever. Go look at what they do. Because that's somebody who's seen the reality. And that is incredibly important to tap into that. That's so important. Anyways, guys, I will catch you guys in probably about 15 to 20 minutes. Um, I hope you're having an, an absolutely wonderful day. I hope you got to share with me some of the details as to my logic, what I've been through in life, et cetera. Um, and we will kind of catch up a little bit farther down the line. Yes, Gary Katowski, we talked about tractors. Who doesn't like a good tractor? Who doesn't like? I like Kubotas. I'm a Kubota kid. I grew up with Kubotas. Um, but anyways, I will catch you a little bit later. And please remember to like, subscribe, leave some stars. And uh, Cincinnati Fireball, uh, let's see, uh, Fire Dollar Nation. Um, Tenebrous, you're super ill. Um, send me a donation thing. I'll check it out. I'll definitely, uh, like, if you have, like, a, a GoFundMe, send it over. Uh, I don't see a link, but shoot me an email. Email is info at disabilityresolution.com. Again, info at disabilityresolution.com. I hope you're doing okay. Um, again, Cincinnati Fireball, thank you for doing that announcement. That's awesome. Uh, we have to obviously take care of those individuals who are part of the community. We want people to be better. And we want people to be doing well. So um, anyways, I will catch you a little bit later. You have a wonderful day and I'll see you probably about 15, 20 minutes, maybe 30 minutes. I got to take sweetie outside, make sure she's good. And then I'll be back for the final video. Just so you know, the final video talks about the rule changes when it comes to commissioners. So we did kind of a, a, a pro what the future of Biden is going to be um, when it comes to the social security administration uh, so this is more pro left, which I think is good ideas, really good ideas that he's pushing here. Uh, I think Commissioner Martin O'Malley is the man to be able to go ahead and push these ideas, even though it came down a little bit harm, uh, hard on like, you know, the idea of city folk. You just have to understand city folk. There's a disconnect where they don't understand the same things that I've been through. And I've been in the cities. I've lived in the city. I was in Boston for a very long time. But the point is, we did a Biden video. The next video will be a Trump oriented video. But it's really it's not actually a Trump. It's more of a what happens with commissioners as a result of the Supreme Court. So that you understand if there's a quick switch over how that law works. All right. Uh, Blasty Pow Wow. Uh, pow Pow. Thank you for the doll 99 donation. That's awesome. Uh, that's very, very cool. Uh, let's see. Da, da, da. So that's good. There you go. OK, so I, I don't Blasty, were you in the military? Is that why? Is that why you were like, yes, I would support, you know, the uh, the female, uh, you know, uh, being, you know, being forced into that military. I don't know. But anyways, guys, I'm going to pop off. I'm going to go take Sweetie outside. I will catch you a little bit later. You have a wonderful, wonderful day. And I'll be back probably like 15, 20 minutes, maybe 30 minutes. All right. Thank you so much. I'll catch you later. All right. Bye bye, everybody. Bye bye.